Grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text today is the second lesson appointed for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost, taken from John's first letter. Let's go ahead and give our attention to these words and take them to heart. First John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, boasting about material possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. This is God's Word. Let's pray. O oh Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. I can't breathe. Familiar words? I think for many of us they are. I can't breathe. It's words that we have heard, seen, maybe even used ourselves. They seem to be everywhere, whether it's in the news, on the internet. I've even seen them as I go around town here in Algoma. I've seen them written on the roads, on the sidewalks, in chalk. I can't breathe. Those words have a powerful meaning, and I think we understand what is really at the root of why those words are so powerful for so many people in the world. It's because this world is a mess. It really is, isn't it? Sin and evil, injustice and violence, The things that John writes about in our text seem to be around every corner or right in front of our face. Whether it is uh, things that have to do with the desires of the human flesh, such as sexual sins, or whether it's material possessions and the boasting of what one has and the greed and materialism of the world, these things are all around us. And while we may think and find some brief comfort in the fact that so much of it seems far away from us here in our community and here in our congregation, we know it's really not that far away. And again and again, it comes up into our life, popping up. And after a while, after enough times, after enough struggle, we just want to shut it off. I can't breathe. I don't want to have to deal with this anymore. The Apostle John, who wrote these words of our text, lived a, a long life, the longest of all of the apostles of Jesus. And in that long life, he saw many, many great evils. He saw the other apostles being put to death violently, one after the other, so that only he remained of those disciples of Jesus. He himself was a victim of lies and betrayal, turned over to the authorities. Why? Because he was a Christian, sent off into exile to live by himself, isolated alone. But probably what really crushed his heart is the subject matter of the letter he writes. His dear children, his dear, dear children, as he calls them, his fellow Christians, his dear children, they were listening to lies, and they were starting to believe them. 
Lies that were confusing about who Jesus is and what he has done. Painting Jesus as, as just a creation of God, a good guy, a good instrument in God's hands, but not the Savior of the world. And that false teaching that captured their hearts led them to give their lives to such wickedness and evil because then it didn't matter if they gratified the desires of the sinful flesh anymore. Why not and go live in sexual freedom and do whatever you want with your body? Why not go and mistreat others and not be concerned about their health and their well-being and just live a self-centered life? I think we can understand why John would be, shall we say, shocked, horrified by what he sees. It's for that reason that John writes as he does. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Watch out. Don't be careful. Because if you love the world, how can the love of the Father be in your heart? Are we really... Are we really the kind of people that have hearts that are so big that we can love the things of the world and love God at the same time? Are our hearts big enough to hold a, a love for sexual sins, for pornography and lust, and say, oh, that's okay, I can watch that stuff, I can endure that stuff, I can, I can handle that kind of stuff, and we can handle that and give ourselves fully in love to the Father? Can we pursue relationships that we know that we shouldn't, illicit ones, ones that we know are not good for us, and still pursue a full relationship with our Father? Can we pursue the material things of this world, all the comforts and pleasures and entertainments and joys of this world, and still pursue the goodness and grace of our God in Jesus Christ, our Savior? Is that the stuff that is really going to satisfy. The world and its desires will pass away. And is that where we want to have our eternal soul pursuing, attached to the things that pass away? In the end, all these things that we have will pass away. Our homes, our possessions, our vehicles, they're all going to pass away one day. They're going to come to an end. They're going to not be around for us. Our worldly joys, whether it be our games, our toys, our entertainments, our hobbies, your, your favorite musical genre, even your favorite musical group that you love and long for and want to listen to all the time will pass away. The people, sad to say, family, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, they pass away too. your community, your neighborhood, your nation. As amazing and as great as they are, as much as we love them, as much as we are willing to fight and die for freedoms and rights, they too will pass away. It is because those things pass away that our Lord warns us to not love them. Do not hold on to them. Do not treat them as if that is the very thing in which your life consists. Because it doesn't. 
But God makes a promise to you. And it's actually not just a promise, it's his will for you. And it's because it's his will you can stake your entire life and everything you are and do on it. For all of the homes and all of the possessions that you lose, God is going to provide for you a mansion and more. A mansion in heaven prepared for you by the Son of God himself, just as he promised. For the people that pass away. God promises to you an undying family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to whom one day you will never, ever, ever again have to say goodbye. They will always be there with you. And for the joys the hobbies and entertainments, the things that occupy your mind and your hands, the things that you so love to do. God promises to you uh, the kind of joy that doesn't depend upon how you feel that day and how much energy you have. It's not going to waver and change depending upon what you ate or how well you slept. It is going to be the perfect, unwavering joy of the love of God that so fills you. It seems to be coming out of every fiber of your being. It's going to be rendered in crystal clear quality in the glory and love of God as you see Him face to face. Undimmed, untarnished joy. And God gives you this promise, this forever that He promises you, and He cries out to you day by day that you might hear this, believe it, live for it. And He points you to Jesus because through Him you have it. This Jesus as, him, as he spoke himself, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. From his first breath that he took when he was born, flavored with the stable, the bar, smell of the barn, to his last dying breath on the cross with all the blood and sweat and death of Calvary in that breath and with that last breath crying out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Every breath he took was one of serving his fellow people, living in that love of God that sent him to be the Savior of the world. On that cross, as Jesus gave his life, as he gave his last breath for you, it was a payment, a fulfillment of what we do with our breath. Each and every time, each and every moment that we sin, that we look after the things of the world and maybe look a little too long. And we waste our time, our energy, our money on things that will not last. Jesus died. And now all that guilt is gone. God promises that your sins are forgiven. Gone like a breath in the wind never to return. Jesus' body was taken down from the tomb, still, not a breath. Placed in that cold tomb and the stone was rolled in front of it, suddenly, 
Sunday morning, the breath of life returns. One breath in the cold, damp, dark of that tomb, and Jesus is alive again. The angels roll the stone away, and the sun and the fresh air come pouring in, and Jesus, alive, takes breath of freedom and life, never to be taken away again. No more suffering, no more sadness, or death, or pain. That breath of life is ours too. Our breath in this world is one of struggle. Day by day as we carry the cross like our Savior Jesus, just as He did in this world, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be suffering and death and pain and injustice and terror and all those things. And God promises to bring us safely through. And finally, one day when we breathe our last breath of this world, we can commit ourselves to the hands of our loving Father, fall asleep in peace, or be caught up to the clouds on that last day if Jesus returns when we're still alive, and we will all enter glory. I can't breathe. It's kind of a, a cry, a plea. Maybe not the best one for a Christian congregation to use, unless we're honestly taking a stand against injustice and evil, which I hope we do, casting votes wisely for our elected officials, taking a stand when we can and should against what is evil in this world. But perhaps there's something better that we can use as a battle cry, as we get ready to go back out into that world and carry our cross. A sword? Jesus did say, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, but I don't, I don't think that's what he meant that we should draw our swords, like those disciples did. Remember the disciples, uh, Jesus was being betrayed, and Lord, shall we fight with our swords? And they're getting ready to fight. Put your swords away. Don't you know that those who fight with the sword will die by the sword? What does Jesus say when he comes to his disciples? Peace be with you. Uh, maybe the words of the Apostle Paul, which we heard not too long ago. This is a trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the, the world to save sinners. Or the Apostle Paul again, we preach Christ crucified. Maybe we won't get huge crowds to gather around those words. But we will have faithful hearts and listening ears as people come to listen to Jesus. Maybe that's what we should use. Maybe it's words we already use, isn't it? Come and see. Come and see Jesus. And maybe those words of Jesus himself as he heads back into heaven, he says to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Come and see. Go Proclaim. That's what it means to carry the cross and live today, forever, in Jesus. Amen.